Hello everyone, I'm Becky Goldsmith with Piece of Cake and thank you for joining me today, September 1st. In the newsletter I said August 1st, but really it's September 1st. Don't know how we got here. Thank oh, you wait a minute. Thank you for joining me today, September 1st, in the newsletter. <laughs> Whoa, that was weird. I had YouTube pulled up on my other computer, so I was talking to myself <laughs> over there. That's so strange. Anyway, thank you for taking um, today some time out with me. As I said, it's September 1st. And again, I know, again, birds in Toyland are behind me. Today they're behind me because yesterday I did a live interview with Sophie Scardacci. And I think you can find it on Facebook. I really do need to find that link. Um, it was fun, and I had this up behind me. You might enjoy watching it. I don't know. It's I, I was live, and this was behind me, so it's still there. And the reason these were behind me yesterday and today is that the next class for Birds in Toyland starts September 9th, you know, just not quite a, a week, a little more than a week away. I've talked to you about it a lot. You can find links on my website. I'm not going to belabor the point because today I have a lot to talk to you about. So today, this is for you, Anne. This is for you, Anne, in Michigan, because Anne has been working on a walk in the mountains, and she's she. <laughs> There's a lot of little tiny pieces in in a walk in the mountains, and let me show you the quilt. Let me show you the quilt. Okay, here we go. So this is a walk in the mountains, and she's made several of the blocks. S plugging away, sticking with it. I'm really proud of her. But she's gotten to the rose block, and the rose block has some little tiny serrated leaves. And she assures me that she is going to lose her mind <laughs> working on these, and could I please tell her how to do it? So today I'm telling everyone how to do it. Now, this pattern, I should say, a walk in the mountains was one of our blocks of the month and I actually did not make this pattern. This, is, this was Linda's idea. She wanted to make this quilt, so this is Linda's quilt. I drew the patterns, but she made the quilt. It's her idea from the beginning. Um, so that is her applique right there. That's Linda's applique. And let me go here. Why isn't that? Go oh, there it is. So that's what the pattern looks like. It is very complex, uh, truth be told. And the flower, or I'm sorry, the leaf I'm going to show Anne and you today is leaf number 18. And just so you could see the scale, it is smaller than an inch. And it's serrated. Each side of the leaf has one, two, three outer points and two inner points. This leaf has very subtle inner curves and it has outer curves, as do all of those <laughs> leaves. All right, so first let's talk about how to prepare the leaf. Uh, let's see here, I wanna click that. I made my template, cut it out. I chose the fabric, and I chose this fabric in particular because it ravels pretty easily, and Anne wanted to see if I could do it with the fabric that was not batik, because batik doesn't ravel very much. So I chose this. It happens to be directional. I placed the fabric right side up on my sandpaper board. I've got the leaf. Under normal circumstances, I would turn it on the diagonal grain of the fabric because edges that are on the bias turn under a little more gracefully than edges on the straight of grain. Although on this shape, I'm not sure that it matters so much. But if I was really making this, I would want the stripe here to follow the line of the leaf. So that's the way I traced it. When you trace everything right side up on the sandpaper board, make sure that you really do trace all the way next to the edge of the fabric and that on these little bitty inner points you get them drawn. Notice that my lines extend beyond the edges of those points 
that ensures that I get the whole point drawn. Now I've already gone all the way around this and traced it, so I'm not going to do that again in the interest of saving time. And I have already cut my shape out. Notice that I didn't just gloss over the fact that there are inner points there. I followed the shape, adding about 3 16 of an inch seam allowance all the way around. There's a slight inner point at the bottom that's reflected in the seam allowance, and these edges at the top have a subtle inner curve. Always remember that the seam allowance begins on the inside edge of the chalk. So here, the chalk is part of the seam allowance, which makes a difference because my chalk line is pretty wide. Be sure when you cut your shapes out that you use really good scissors. I used my bigger professional scissors. They're serrated. You might use something else. This would also be a shape where you could cut it out with smaller scissors and that would be okay too. Definitely you're going to want small wonderful scissors for clipping these inner points. Okay, so it's not just how you sew it. It's always with applique how you prepare your shapes. Um, and that, that starts right from the beginning, from the tracing and, and how accurate are you, all these things. And I've talked about many of the things that I went through very quickly there um, before, but the sandboard and the chalk and all that stuff. I've talked about it before. I'm sure I'll talk about it again. But next, I want to talk to you about finger pressing. But before I do that, this is the other thing I want to say. And that is sometimes on these small shapes, it makes sense to do cutaway applique. And if this was a different style of shape, I might have done cutaway applique with it. What cutaway is, is when you've got little tiny, tiny shapes, you trace them on the fabric, but you don't cut them out exactly. You leave some extra fabric around it. You can still finger press them, you pin them the same way, but when you're getting ready to sew, then you trim away the excess fabric. The reason that's less of a good idea with this is because there is so much intricate cutting because of the inner and outer points. So I didn't even really think about doing cutaway with this particular shape. If it had been not a serrated shape, you know, not with little points, I might have done cutaway applique. Okay, finger pressing. Let's talk about that. The next most important step is finger pressing. What you want to do, and this is true on all my needle turn applique, every single one, it's always the most important step turn the seam allowance under and just give it a good pinch. Don't scrape it with your fingernail. Don't lay it down and iron it. Don't try to starch it. Don't try to do anything else. Just finger press it. And on these bitty little points, you will notice that your finger pressed edge goes beyond the end of the point in both directions. And that's fine. It actually makes turning those points easier. I'm taking my time around the bottom of the leaf on this outer curve. And then I'm going to finger press there and there. And you might not think this makes much of a difference, but trust me when I tell you that it does you are telling the little bitty threads exactly how you want them to fold under right here. So up there I want two crossed creased folds. So there's my shape finger pressed with a, with a thing on the bottom. I have fuzz on the bottom of my leaf. Don't know where it came from, but this isn't a for real leaf. So, well, okay, I take that back. It's a for real leaf and I'm going to sew it for real on a piece of fabric. But am I making this block? No, no, I'm just demonstrating how to sew the leaf. So I'm not going to worry about whatever that is on the underside of my fabric. 
Okay, I didn't worry about it, not one tiny little bit. Okay, you will notice through the next uh, demonstrations that every now and then my camera goes out of focus. I had it zoomed in so tight that it just did. But after watching it, I decided that it wasn't out of focus in key enough areas or often enough that it mattered. So I apologize, but there you go. <laughs> just pretend like your glasses are fucking up. It's not me, it's, it's your glasses. Um, okay, next thing, next thing before I move on. For those of you who don't typically finger press, I would encourage you to give it a shot. Really, give it a fair trial because that is one step that will make turning your um, needle turned edges under so much easier. So, so much easier. Okay, next up, I want to talk to you about pinning and beginning to sew. Oh, I thought I clicked it. I didn't click it. If I was sewing this for real on a block, I would have a background all prepared and pressed in half horizontally and vertically and I'd have an overlay and I would work under the overlay on top of my sandboard because the sandboard keeps the background from shifting. And I would lift up the overlay and slide the leaf in place and get it perfectly positioned, give it a little pat as I'm doing here, I would remove the overlay and then I would pin it. Since I'm just doing a sample, all I'm going to do is give it a little pat and pin it. I, I do offer on the website lots of pins. I could use the three quarter inch clovers, but on these tiny shapes, that is not my first choice. I could use and might use the three quarter inch little house pins. The downside to these is that the head is a little bigger than I like, but they're a really fine, flexible pin. That, that would be a nice choice, as would be Karen K. Buckley's Shorter Perfect Pin. These are a little trickier to use because they're so bendy, so it would be one or the other of those. Another option are the half-inch sequin pins, but I have grown accustomed to the longer flexible pins, so I'm, I'm going to use these. I'm going to want to start sewing right about here because it's relatively flat and it's going to point me toward these and that's really what you want to see. I want to put a pin in so that that area is held in place without the pin being in the way. I think I'm going to come down here and pin that. Now this pin is going to have to change direction or come out entirely once I get to that point, but for now it's holding the part of the leaf in position that I want held in position. I've rotated the sandboard. I'm going to use this pin and put it in to hold this whole edge in position. This is long enough that I can do it that way. Now, it's not that I'm ignoring the other side of the leaf. These two pins are holding everything in position pretty well. As I have to remove pins because they're in the way, I will shift them so that they're working on the other side of the leaf. Some of you might be wondering, why don't I just dot it down with some glue? Number one, because I don't like to work with little dots of glue, and number two, Pins don't leave any residue. They work really well. You can take them out when they get in your way. I don't mind pins and I do mind glue in this instance. You may be different. I'm going to use my easy threader to thread my needle. I'm using the number 11 tulip applique needle. It's a very fine needle. You put the eye end of the needle down in the small, the small stack, so there's a big side and a small side. I'm going to drop that down. And I'm going to thread up with this thread that came out of my bright Super Bob box. 
it's not a perfect match all the way across the leaf, but it's a pretty darn close match. Close enough, I'm going to use this. It's a little dark and a little bit too green for the blue side, so my stitches may show a little bit, but not so much that I really care. I've got a whole video on how to use this, so I'm going to do this quickly. I'm going to put the thread in there, pop it into position, move my finger out of the way, gently push the little button. See the little loop of thread that's come out? I'm going to pull that through. Boom. I'm threaded. Done. I'm going to cut that. There we go. And I'm going to do my knot. This will be a three wrap knot. One, two, three. Hold the wraps, pull it through, boom, there's my knot. I have multiple videos online that walk you through how to make an invisible stitch, so I'm not going to walk you through that so much right now. Notice I buried the knot on the underside of the leaf. I'm going to use my needle to turn that under. Notice how well it turns on the finger pressed fold. Do pay attention to the way I'm holding my needle because it makes a difference. I've got my index finger at the eye end of the needle, holding the shaft of the needle between my middle finger and thumb, and I'm going straight down, feeling the bottom finger, my middle finger on the underside, rocking over it, pushing up. And you know what I can tell. I can tell that it's been a while since I've done any hand applique because I don't have a callus on the end of my finger. I might end up having to use a leather thimble pad there. All right, right here, I am at the first outer point. When you reach an outer point, you want to do a tack stitch. So I'm going to put my needle in as if I was starting another stitch, but I'm going to come up right in place, right there. And that's going to lock the first side of that point in position. And now we get to the exciting part. <laughs> oh, the exciting part. Jim jumped behind me. Yes, the exciting part is coming right up. The exciting part is longer. We're probably going to be a little longer than 30 minutes today. Two things I wanted to tell you before we jump into the totally exciting part. Number one, when you pin, especially if you've gone to the effort to get your leaf exactly where you want it on the block, do not pick your block up and pin it. Pin flat against the sandboard. The sandboard is under the background to keep the background from shifting as you position and then pin your applique pieces in place. The other thing I want to tell you, that really nifty threader, the easy threader, it's back ordered. We've, I've been out of stock for a while. There is no known time when it might come. So if you have one, treasure it. If you don't have one and want to order it, like right now, know that we don't know when we're going to get them in. We are happy to hold your order, but there you go. Okay, and you know if you're watching this sometime in the future, maybe we've got them. I, I, that could happen too. All right, so uh, here we go. The exciting part. Uh, there. I'm going to need to clip that inner point. And I'm also going to need to move this pin. I'm going to pull this out and see how that pin is holding the edge of the leaf in position. I'm going to shift this and bring this pin about to there. Actually, I'm going to put this pin right about here just to get it out of the way and I might bury it like that. Okay, turn your work so that you're cutting into the inner point. I'm using my small professional scissors. They come to a beautiful point and that's important. When you put your scissors in to clip anything, remember that the cut happens on the left side of the blade you can see. If you have regular old right-handed scissors, that is. So when I put this in, I want my clip to be completely centered two and through the line, 
just barely to the edge, inside edge of the line. I don't want it to bend to the right or the left. I just want to clip. Boom. And I'm going to turn this back in my hand and pick up my toothpick. This is your next best tool. Do not try to use your um, needle to turn this under. Because this is so short, you don't want to fool around with this. Take your toothpick. My middle finger is supporting the applique on the underside. I've got my thumb close but out of the way. I'm going to place the toothpick on top of the folded edge of the point here. I'm pushing down against my finger with the toothpick. Now I'm not just going down with the point. I'm using pretty much the whole end of the toothpick and I dampened it. I'm going to dampen it again because a damp toothpick grabs the fabric better. And then I'm going to use the toothpick like a windshield wiper and get that point turned under. And then see that, that little fuzzy bit right there? I'm just going to very gently pull that in. Don't stretch it, don't overdo it, just, just get it in. All the while remembering, this is a leaf, right? This is an organic shape. If it's not exactly, exactly perfect the way it's drawn, that is just fine. But see, there's that first edge. I am not going to worry about the next side of that inner point yet. I'm going to put my needle in almost exactly at the point, but just a little bit on the second side. And I'm going to come up. And here, I'm going to catch a little more of the fabric than I normally would. And that's because <laughs> that inner point is so close, there's almost no seam allowance there. So be really careful. I'm going to put my needle here and come up on the first side of that inner point and see I'm catching more of the fabric here too. I'm not bringing my needle up right at the folded edge. I'm catching more. I'm going to pull that up. Now I might just encourage that edge gently, not overdoing it, just encourage that edge in. I'm going to put my needle in right there at the inner point, turn the needle so I'm coming up straight into the point at a diagonal. Whoop. Oh gosh, I don't want to don't want to mess with that edge. I'm going to go ahead and do a tack stitch here because I often do at an inner point. Okay, so right here there's my edge that needs to turn under. I'm going to use my toothpick and just gently fold that under. There's only enough space here to make maybe three stitches. So I'm going to go in again at the deepest part of the inner point. I'm going to come up on the second side and again catch a little more fabric. I want to mirror the stitches on the first side. And you want to do this because if you bring your needle up too close to the raw edge where there isn't a seam allowance, it's just going to fray out. Okay, now as I'm working myself toward that outer point and shoot, I'm practically there. I'm back to the folded edge of the fabric. And you can see those threads. Yep, you can see those threads. You can also see that it's an inner point that doesn't have little furry bits sticking out. If I had had a thread that matched the blue a little more closely, you wouldn't see that as much. Do I care that you can see it a little bit? Nope, I don't care because over time it really doesn't matter. Those stitches tend to sink in a little bit. The thread that I'm using, this thread, 
off the bobbin is from Superior. It is a 50 weight two ply cotton thread. It's strong and it's fine. And inside the two boxes, the bright collection and the soft collection, there are some really good shades of thread. In this case, the leaf is more green than it is blue. So I chose the green that worked best with the bulk of the leaf. It just so happens that I started the demonstration on the blue side so the thread's a little more obvious. Now I wanted to show you what clipping looks like with the Karen K. Buckley scissors because I know a lot of you also have these. The blade tips are thicker. You can still make a beautiful cut with these, but when you put your scissor in to make that clip, and let me stop here and say, you know how that fabric is folded under? If you can, get into that so that you're only cutting the top layer of thread, not the folded over bit. So when I put my scissor in, see how it looks like I'm cutting way over to the right? But what I'm looking at is the left side of that top blade. I want that to be centered and then I'll make my clip. And it too clips perfectly. Use your toothpick again. I can go ahead and get that edge to turn under. I'm going to place my toothpick right there, my damp toothpick. I'm going to rotate that under. Calm thoughts. Think calm thoughts. What else is it important to have here? You need good light. This is not a thing you can do under bad lighting. Okay, well I should elaborate. This is not a thing I can do under bad lighting. The other thing you want to remember here is that this is slow. Good heavens, this is slow. So these tiny little leaves may be tiny, but they are going to take as long as something bigger because you have to stop and do this sort of thing really often. Here we go. I'm going to push that down a little bit, catch a little more of the fabric. Then I'm going to go in on the diagonal at the inner point. I'm going to do a tack stitch here. I'm going to go in, catch that. Ooh, my thread knotted. There we go. Then I'm going to turn. And this has a flat part before it turns into that curve. And my pin is in the way. So I want to very carefully shift that pin, find my needle again, under. It's important that you be able to see the chalk line. So when you are tracing your shape, make sure you make a line you can see. And it could be that the line you can see better is made with a graphite pencil. If that is the case, keep the graphite not too thick, Keep make a fine line, very fine line, and don't use a heavy hand. And that will make a line that's dark enough to see. All right, I'm going to rotate this, maybe move this pin over here. Now, this has a subtle curve, but it's not so much of a curve I think that I'm going to need to clip it. So I'm going to use the toothpick. There's that. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I want to do a tack stitch here on this outer point like that. I can't remember if I did the tack stitch on this most recent point. If I didn't, I should have. And then I'm going to sew with small stitches. 
and I don't think I emphasized it, but when you're going around these small shapes, you don't want your stitches to get long. In fact, they will be much shorter than your average stitch. I don't think we're talking a sixteenth of an inch, but it could be closer to a sixteenth of an inch than an eighth of an inch. Okay, when you get down here, it's an outer point. Take a tack stitch, turn your work in your hand, shift this pin over here. Actually, I'm going to shift it a little bit more. When you turn the outer point, it's like any other outer point, take your toothpick, place it here, rotate that under, pull your thread out in the direction of the point. Notice I didn't get it all the way turned this time. So I'm going to take my toothpick, place it right there, and turn it under some more. You have to get aggressive with some of these. And by aggressive, what I mean is this. See that right there? I want to take that toothpick and push it in, manipulate the seam allowance. I'm using my fingernail to push down on it. If anything feels wadded up, you can reach underneath and smooth away from the point. That does not look too bad. So I'm checking my line. I can definitely take one stitch at the end, which I will do. Oh, I've still got a little bit of a bubble there. There we go. I'm going to make one stitch down here, very close to the outer point. Get that tucked in, and then I can begin manipulating the rest of this seam allowance under, and then it is more of the same on the other side. It is. Here's the thing about applique. Once you know the stitch and all the prep work, of course, it's outer points, inner points, outer curves, inner curves. If you can do those, you can sew anything. It's a question of remaining calm and addressing each thing as you go. A uh, couple of things. Those inner points. Back in the day, way back in the day, when I was taught how to turn an inner point, it involved like doing a big scoop and swoop out of the, you know, you clip it and then you do a lot of the, don't do that. If you swoop and scoop and stretch an inner point, you'll get an inner curve, but you are not going to get a point. You have to work one side and then the other side. And you really do have to make more visible stitches starting at the folded edge and working down so that they show a little bit more as you get to the inner point. Because if you keep your stitches way out at the edge, it's just going to fray apart. So you can either have frays or you can have an inner point that doesn't fray. These are your choices. Uh, let's see. Oh, and when you clip the inner point, you may have noticed you keep that clip centered, but you go to and through the line to the other side of the line because if you stop your clip short of where the actual corner is, you're going to get a curve, not a point. Do I use glue? No, I don't use glue. Not for this. And I use glue for, um, that was a question, comment question. I use glue when I'm doing turned edge machine applique. I use glue some in English paper piecing. Shirley was the one asking about the glue. Hello, Shirley. No, no, no glue. There is no reason to use glue. There's no reason to use fray check. Finger pressing helps a lot. Using the toothpick helps. Remaining calm, taking each step as it comes, and moving your threads more into the body of the applique as you go. All right, I got one more video. I told you we'd go long today, but there's a lot here today. Here we go. When you get back to the beginning, you're likely to be faced with this little pointy bit of fabric. It's better to just go ahead and turn this under, and you'll notice what happens. I've got a pleat 
and a flat part and a pleat over there. So I'm going to come in. This often happens on circles or other shapes that begin and end on an outer curve. So the first thing I want to do is address the pleat and point that formed on the leading edge of that little triangle of fabric. I think I can get two stitches before I get to the other side. And here, because of the way the fabric folded over, the entry into that pleat is on the other side of me. So I'm reaching in and just opening that fabric back and forth like that, smoothing it out. Take your time. You know, applique isn't a race. Applique isn't a race. If it is, the only person you're racing is yourself. So take as much time as you need to perfect the shape and sew it on down. When you get back to the beginning, I like to sew beyond my first stitch by about a half a stitch just because I like to do that. I think it gives a prettier join. I'll take my needle to the back and do an ending knot right here. There's my anchor stitch. There's my knot. There we go. I buried the tail between the layers. So that's what the back of my work looks like. Not bad. You can see that the stitches, they're pretty small, smaller than my average stitches. And that's what the front looks like right there. Now, what would be fun to see is, is it, oh yeah, it is pretty much straight on the side of, size of that leaf. Really, I was a little bit afraid to check that out, but I'm, I'm pleased. Over time, what will happen with these stitches that seems sort of obvious now is that they will sink into the, into the fabric. And the pattern does have a little more embroidery, and you can add some little embroidered hairs on the edges of the points to make it look more like one of those sort of fuzzy rose leaves. Not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah, I didn't think it was bad at all. Okay, I wanted to show you in real life. There's my leaf. Let me move it closer. You can see, I think, that the stitches, if it stays focused there, you can see that the stitches are, um, they're already sinking into the fabric. Okay, so we have a question. On inner points, I really struggled to get the left and right side balanced. Yeah. Yeah, it's a struggle. <laughs> it takes practice. Uh, any tips? Practice. Practice is one. Um, often what I do when I'm making those stitches leading into an inner point or leading out, it's like I test the water with the tip of the needle. I, will, I don't just jump in and say, okay, I'm making this stitch. I'll put the needle in next to the edge of the applique, turn it and come up and sort of poke the tip of the needle through, testing to make sure that the fabric on top, the applique fabric that's been clipped, has, um, isn't gonna fray there, that it's sturdy enough to maintain its weave. And it gives me an opportunity to sort of check the depth of the stitch. But I have been doing this since, gosh, the 80s, the late 80s. And when I'm really on my game, I can match those stitches pretty well. Every now and then, yeah, they don't match as well. It takes practice. And my strong advice is don't beat yourself up. You know, the key here, the key, and this is for you <laughs> too, the key is does your applique stay attached to the block? Okay, that, that's a win. You sew it down, it stays put. Is it pretty from a distance? Yay, that's good. Is anybody but you gonna get up close and nitpick? Probably not. So do your best, make yourself happy, 
Really, make yourself happy. Always do your best, but make yourself happy. Don't make yourself crazy. Remember, you're doing this for fun. <laughs> really, truly, really remember that. You're doing this for fun. Okay, so unless Lorna tells me there's another question, I, we've, we're 40 minutes in, so I, I think it's time to say goodbye. Uh, you can send me questions at becky.pieceofcake at gmail.com or, you know, suggest a topic. I've got a list of things. And next week, oh, I should show the next one. Next week, I think what I'm going to do is share with you a thing that my friend Sarah Myers has shared with me. She does a lot of sewing for various organizations. And there is an organization, okay, I have to look now because she told me and I forgot. She's told me more than once, you know, it goes in and out. But there is an organization, I don't think it's the firefighters up, you know, who are fighting the fires. Could be, no, or it's homeless in hot places. There are groups of quilters who are beginning to make those cooling neck scarves, and she has got it down to a science, and she is sharing with me how she does it. They're really fast to make, um, doesn't take much fabric. You do have to buy some cooling beads for those of you who want to be prepared, and she said it doesn't take much, so if you get a bag of cooling beads, it will last forever. Um, I'm going to share that with you because it's not just I'm, there's a lot of people who need to be cool. She was even saying there's probably places in New Orleans right now who could use these. Um, so, so that's what I'm going to show you next week. It's my commitment. I'm going to do that. And so I will see you next week and share this with you. Uh, two o'clock Central Time next Wednesday. I'm looking forward to seeing you then. And until then, may you have many happy stitches. Thanks for watching. I'm going to find my button. There it is.